Hey everyone, I'm Tassinix, and welcome back to another Mod Guide highlighting series. Uh, we've knocked out a couple of the most recent factions based on the marquee release schedule and some of your requests. The next most requested team is the Sir Junda Unaligned Force User team. So, without further ado, let's jump right into her leadership and then get through her kit. Her lead is Rekindle. All allies have plus 20% defense, max health, and max protection doubled for unaligned force user allies. At the start of each encounter, all unaligned force user and Jedi allies gain protection up and tenacity for two turns. So right here you might be thinking, oh, she kind of works with Jedi too. That's really about it as far as what she does for Jedi. Like you'll see the rest of this, she's really just meant for unaligned force users. If all dark, uh, sorry, if all allies are dark side or light side unaligned force users and there are no galactic legend allies at the start of the battle, until an ally takes their first turn, whenever an enemy starts their turn, all unaligned force user allies gain 5% crit chance, crit damage, and offense stacking until the end of battle. While allies have accuracy up, they have plus 50% crit damage, and all other unaligned force user allies gain 5% turn meter whenever another unaligned force user ally takes damage from an enemy. And now we can get to the GAC, uh, GAC Omicron effect. While in Grand Arenas, if all allies are dark side or light side unaligned force users and there are no Galactic Legend allies at the start of battle, all allies gain 30% max health and max protection and are immunity and are having immunity to ability block and days. At the start of each encounter, all unaligned force user and Jedi allies gain protection up 75% instead of the above mentioned 50%. For each instance of damage any unaligned force user ally uh, deals to an enemy, they gain 10% offense stacking for two turns, and until an ally takes their first turn, whenever an enemy starts their turn, all unaligned force user allies gain an additional 10% crit chance, crit damage, and offense stacking until the end of battle. So that 10% is with the 5%. So it is 15% per in Grand Arena. It's pretty impressive. Okay, and then whenever an ally dispels a debuff, they recover 15% health and protection and gain advantage for two turns. Whenever an ally dispels a buff, they recover 15% health and protection at the end of their turn, and they gain foresight for two turns. Wow. So this is a really complicated leadership, but what, what the important thing to recognize is passively it's handing out a lot of survivability, health, um, immunity to ability block and daze here in Grand Arena. But the signature thing about her leadership is she wants the enemy team to lap her team. Um, as many times as they can without killing her because it's, you know, without killing her teammates uh, or her, I guess. But the idea here is that until the first time an ally on her team, including herself, takes their first turn, uh, they're going to be stacking offense, crit damage, crit chance, and that's just going to continue until the first person goes. So it can be a, a real serious problem. All right, next one. Let's talk about her unique unity through adversity. At the start of battle, Seer gains 20% tenacity for each dark side unaligned force user ally, 20% max protection for each other light side for, uh, unaligned force user ally, and 20% defense for each Jedi ally. If all allies are dark side or light side unaligned force users, and there are no galactic legend allies at the start of battle, at the end of each of her turns, Seer, Seer's cooldowns are increased by one. Whenever an enemy takes a turn, her cooldowns are decreased by one. So you might have heard about this, but this is the specific reason why she benefits from being absolutely wood slow. She doesn't take a ton of turns because her speed would be so low from that, but remember, there's passive turn meter generation built into this team, and uh, as far as her abilities go, if you actually want to be able to do anything other than her special, she really needs to not be fast. She needs the enemy team to just be taking a bunch of turns so she can get to use her specials. All right, her basic, keep fighting. Deal physical damage to target enemy. All Ufu allies gain tenacity up for two turns and all allies gain accuracy up for two turns. And yeah, I'm just gonna be saying Ufu from now on. I'm not gonna keep saying unaligned force user. 
but yeah, so that's where accuracy up for the whole team comes from off of her basic. So if you recall, her leadership gives out 50% critical damage to all allies who have accuracy up. So if you're wondering where it comes from, there you go. All right, her first special, Force Barrier. All allies gain 10% bonus protection for two turns. Gain an additional 5% bonus protection for each active Jedi ally and 10% bonus protection for each active dark side or light side Ufu ally for two turns. All Ufu allies gain defense up for two turns. The weakest dark side or light side Ufu ally gains damage immunity for one turn. So yeah, with her two specials, this one is shielding, right? This is going to preserve allies and save the weakest ally. You know, it, you know at least uh, shield them a little bit. So, not a ton to say here, but solid supportability. Okay, Determined Assault. Deal physical damage to target enemy, plus bonus damage equal to 10% of the target's max health, maximum of 200% for each turn an enemy has taken during the encounter. So it'll take you a while to actually get to use this ability for the first time because it starts on a cooldown of 10. But then you understand um, if she's really slow and the enemy, whole enemy team goes, that's five turns taken, her cooldown's reduced by five, and then she loses one when, you know, um, at the end of her next turn, right? She, she has her cooldowns increased. So, all right. Yeah, this ability starts on cooldown, yep, and can't be evaded. That's pretty important, because this is pretty much her only significant damage attack. It would be lame if it could be avoided. All Ufu allies gain defense penetration up for three turns, and the weakest light side unaligned force user ally gains 50% health, recovers 50% health. So it's even got a heal baked into that. So yeah, this does very significant damage, and um, you'll see that you know, it's doing a lot of extra damage based on the target's max health. So if you can, you're choosing high priority targets, but ideally, if you had more than one priority target to go after, you're going after the one that has big health, because this will hurt just so much more. Okay, uh, let's talk about team comps and turn order here real quick. So I put together a couple different things for you guys for five versus five. All these characters are shown in what I think is a reasonable turn order for them. Um, I like Fulcrum to be able to go. Sometimes there's an Ufu meta uh, with Datacrons that allows her to uh, ignore Taunt. We've seen it before, it might come back again. But her going first uh, means that somebody can be greatly wounded because she'll buff herself and then follow it up with her big hit. Um, Malikos wants to throw rocks right after that, which is great. You could end up with a kill right off that. Crew, I like to have enough speed on him where I can you know, be able to renew his taunt if they dispel it. You'll you'll put up your taunt on your first turn, but then you need to be able to come back around to put it back on yourself, right? Even with just a basic. Sir Junda, I like to be kind of second to last. I'd probably have her dead last if it weren't for the fact that I like Cal Kestis to be completely zeroed out on speed. And we'll cover that more in another video, but it's basically because he can be applied with Ray. Uh, Galactic Legend Ray, and there's a serious advantage for him to be able to maintain uh, damage immunity from Ray as long as possible, which is done by low speed. So anyway, that's why Seer's ahead. Otherwise, Seer would be dead last. Now, this is like your main premium 5 versus 5 composition, all right? Uh, it is taking up your crew, and it is taking up Cal. So if you have alternative uses for either, you might consider something different. In the case where you want to set Cal with your Ray team in 5 vs 5, you could just substitute in um, OG Kylo Ren. The fact is, his um, middle that he'll spam feeds turn meter to crew, which helps deal with that problem I was telling you about, um, of him you know, not being able to get enough turns to renew his taunt. Uh, I, I like this, this is a, this is a budget composition and it's still effective. You can't treat it too much differently. All right, there's a lot of damage in here and then you still have a pre-taunt protecting you. But let's say that you want your slacker, uh, your crew with your slacker or something else and you want that, um, you know, OG Cal with your Ray. Uh, well, okay, you probably can't have both because then you're gonna have kind of a crap team. So let's say you needed to have crew somewhere else. You could have Ninth Sister instead. I like her to be the fastest of the bunch 
um, because her first ability is to do her first special, which is not the taunt. So you need her to get to her second turn before she'll put up the taunt on herself. This means that your team's operating without pre-taunt. So that's why I consider OG Cal to be somewhat required in this composition, because if you don't have the mitigation and shielding provided by Cal Kestis and you don't have a pre-taunt targeting your team, you might just get eaten up by something cheap. So this is kind of the least of the three five versus five comps. And of course, in three versus three, I think there's basically two decent comps. Um, this is, again, thinking about defense. You can mix this up whichever way you want for offense. As long as you have Seer and Malakos, you can debate, really, which third that you want to use on attack. But for defense, uh, unless you're wanting to get easily taken out by bounty hunters or something of the like, you provide a lot of damage by having Seer, Malakos, and Ahsoka here. Um, I think that decently blocks out bounty hunters. And then, of course, you have, um, you know, Seer, Malakos, and Crew, and the pre-taunt is often enough to block out lesser counters. So those are basically the way I go. And hopefully the turn meter, uh, you know, the turn order makes sense here. All right, guys, modding breakdown. Um, let me flip this up here for you guys. So I'll go over my mods first. Mine seem to be fairly representative of some of the, you know, a decent number of the top players. Um, I will show you one other alternative modding. So basically, this, you, you saw that there's a lot of protection up and stuff like that in this team. You might think that uh, health primaries are the best thing to go with her to maximize that. And health's okay. Um, I think that protection is slightly better. It, it adds more survivability to her overall. And I think she's, you know, later to be focused in the match. The first thing your, your opponents are going after is your Malakos. And then probably your Ahsoka Tana Fulcrum. Um, she'll come later, so I don't know that she needs to be uh, set up for high health to maximize that. I like the protection to just have more upfront survivability. Uh, so I, that's why I went with this build. Now, as far as the offense set goes, yeah, you only really have the big hit from her third ability, but when that goes, you really need it to kapow. And the longest cooldown you're ever going to have waiting for it is the first time. So it'll come around, if the fight goes long enough, you could probably get a second use out of that. You need it to slap when its time comes. So the true damage that you, or sorry, the bonus damage that this ability does, that third, is based solely on the uh, target's max health, right? So you could make a solid case for why, well, the offense isn't feeding into this bonus damage. That's true, but it is doing physical damage as a base. So having offense baked in is just going to make that slap that much harder. Now, mine's Relic 9. You don't need her to be this, um, this big. You know, Relic 7, Relic 8 is decent for anybody running around in, in Kyber 1. Um, strong protection you know pick as much as you can get a lot of offense here you see that i'm over 7,000. as far as speed goes yeah really slow no particular emphasis added on speed i see some other top players having her even slower than mine and that's okay uh because again you can understand from our reading of her unique we need the enemy team to be lapping her for her to actually get use of her specials all right so that's kind of my offense build, um, about 7.4k offense, 63, almost 64% armor, but just a little bit picked up, but, uh, but that's about it. All right, now let's take a look at Dagger's modding. He went with the protection primaries as well. He went for pure survivability. See that he's even slower than me at 174, so that's great for the reasons we've discussed. Um, decent health, good protection, um, you know, so about a thousand less offense, still a good amount of offense added though, right? I mean, you could go for a defense set that had strong offense baked in through the secondaries and basically come out the same, if not better. The nice thing about his setup in all defense sets is that by the time the fight comes where you're fighting Seer Junda, um, she's going to be, you know, pretty difficult to deal with here because she's gonna probably have the ability to use Determined Assault a couple of times, and she's got 75% armor in this build. That is very serious stuff. So there's a couple different ways you can go, but you wanna be thick, 
you want to have a very high life total, I recommend protection over health. If you're constrained on mods, health will do. Health will do. But uh, I do recommend that protection. Bake as much offense into it. Keep the speed low. All right, applications. Um, here, let me flip over this. So as far as offensive applications, looking here in three versus three, yeah, a lot of folks um, mix this team. You see your Malakos and Starkiller can be used to take on Ray. Uh, Seer Malakos is a great classic solution to Inquisitors. I, I like that a lot. And actually in the current Datacron meta, Malgus is less effective against uh, Inquisitors. So this is probably a, a good go-to. Yeah, so Seer, Malakos, and OG Cal allows you to keep your crew for something else. You know, you could, you could use him um, elsewhere. And note that against Inquisitors, you know, 88% of the time you were winning this without needing a pre-taunt. You just have all of this mitigation and uh, sustain provided by OG Cal. As far as some other comps, yeah, Finn, Rex, a whole bunch of lesser teams, of course, you're going to stomp because Malakos is a monster and we'll cover him. But, oh yeah, I saw somebody, you know, you can mix this with Maul if you want. Seer Maul, Malakos, I know a lot of players try and get cute with that. There's a couple, um, I, I remember that there was like a rare occasion in 3 versus 3 where it was actually cool for me to do this because every time a special, a dark side unaligned force user allies using a special, Malakos will assist. So him doing five pushes can be a pretty severe thing to deal with. Of course, Seer Malakos and Fulcrum is just a great offensive composition. I've used that for a lot of things. I do like it on defense better, though. This is a great defensive team for me. Only if I think that I'm fighting something like Riva on defense frequently would I bother keeping this. Because um, I don't personally go for the Seer Malakos counter to Ray. It gets blocked out by a couple different team comps and why plan for that myself you know not to not to disparage it for anyone else you guys might go for it and that's cool that's completely fair all right quick switch over to five verse five of course you'll see a lot of the same suspects yeah many different forms of ray this seer comp can take on because the way this team ends up increasing its damage and offense as the enemy team laps it that's fine. You want them to go fast. Go as fast as you want. It won't save you. All right. Um, of course, Reva. See, this one was actually a little dicey last season. That's interesting. And that's before the new Inquisitor crown. See, here you go. Now we're talking about Seer Malakos uh, losing to the Finzori Resistance. That's unfortunate. Uh, losing to several different compositions of Ray that are about that... Um, current resistance cron with inflicting debuffs on you, you dispel them and that feeds them offense. So they end up destroying you before you can overwhelm them. Uh, yep, the Saw Guerrera team from last Datacron meta was nasty. Still took it on. Gas 501st, it can do, um, which is helpful. I don't really think about that matchup much, but this versus Gas 501st, Gas 501st is still a pretty serious threat. Like. I'm usually using something like Sith Eternal, so Seer Malakos is not an unreasonable alternative. All right, and then you get down into stuff like this Keller and Beck team, but basically you're able to take on Ray and things that you can endure the damage up front and let yourself ramp. So give it some, uh, you know, give it some thought and try something new for yourself. All right, guys. Uh, I think we'll keep on moving into this faction in the coming days, so thank you so much for watching this. If you like this video, give it a like, give the channel a subscribe to see more. I really appreciate the support and interest. Um, you guys have been overwhelmingly positive with the feedback and comments about this video series, so thank you. I'm going to keep it up. I'll keep listening to your feedback, and uh, yeah, we'll see you on the next video. Until next time, it's been real, it's been awesome, it's been real awesome. Take care.